<coughs> Good morning, everybody. Um, I just... Oh, I forgot to turn my, all my lights on. <coughs> I just uploaded the last video you saw. <coughs> I just uploaded it a few minutes ago. <coughs> so it's... Uh, <coughs> it's uh, Tuesday morning, early. It's 4. I got up at 2 a.m. today. And uh, I wanted you to... I want to mention that because you got to hear Andy. And Andy, I just moved my cat. I was going to get you get it on picture, but I had to put my books down. And that cat is Baby, who is very sick. Now, Baby poops. She's sick, so she's just going to the bathroom all over. She's very sick. My wife knows I used to get upset with a lot of animals, and then they go to the bathroom all over. But she comes in here. She's never done this until the last couple of weeks. And she sneaks in this room. She sleeps right there. Because she's getting ready to die. And I burn incense. This is my, one of my prayer rooms. And I burn incense when I pray. Right there. And so she has peace right there. That sweet cat. And so my wife and them were like kids. Oh, the, the baby's going to go in dad's room. And I said, no, no, I'm letting her go in there. They're like, well, don't be upset when she poops. I said, no, I'm not. And she's so sick. She's, I'm cleaning it up all over in here. But I'm not upset because it's sad. She, her leg is twisted. She's very old and, uh, and sick. And just because of age. So at that stage, you normally put them down and you feel very bad. I feel bad when that happens. So I'm letting her stay in here. But Andy, I wanted him to I'm going to see his brother, David, in a few hours. And uh, I just wanted him to share. There were a few things, and then I'm going to talk a little bit about, I started reading the book of Acts, so I'm going to teach a little bit. Those of you that don't like when I talk about news or politics, the teaching comes up right after that. I'm going to just mention a few things. The New York Times. The New York Times is the paper that, the newspaper that all of the other uh, news organizations pretty much get their cue from the New York Times. Whatever the New York Times is putting, especially on the front page, that's normally considered, you know, the very big news. And all the other media outlets really mostly are, go off of that. So, but the New York Times, uh, they were saying, I read it, it was a clip from a New York Times article in the Corpus paper, or one of them. Uh, let's see. Oh, New York Times. The, the narrative, the story now, because of some of the things about Syria and Putin and our involvement, they're trying to change the narrative into Putin is now getting into a quagmire. Okay, I don't want to do too much on that. But for those who understand that, why are they doing it that way? Because when the Russian president went into Syria, and pretty much this was like a showdown against the U.S., being we're actually flying bomber planes in Syria, bombing ISIS, and the rebels that we are backing up, who are named Free Syrian Army, Russia went in and bombed them, went in, and they're flying military now. And that was a question. Will the U.S. do something that Russia's killing the people that we're backing on the ground? And the U.S. did not. The U.S. backed down. I'm not against the U.S. backing down, okay? I'm just saying that's what we did. But <coughs> they want to change the narrative because that would look very terrible for people to understand that's what happened. So Kerry, John Kerry, Secretary of State, and others are saying, well, you're going to get involved in a quagmire, you're going to get involved in a big mess, and you're not going to get out of which, you know, Taliban is us. The Russians fought the Taliban in Afghanistan, and then when we went in to fight them, we, we were the ones in a quagmire, and we are because of recent events that just happened. I talked about the other day, the bombing of that hospital in Kunduz, which 
we hit that hospital. It's his big question. The reason the leader for that Doctors Without Borders is the hospital we bombed with planes and there's 20-something that were killed and that hospital shut down. The reason they're so upset and calling it a war crime, that's a charitable ministry, Doctors Without Borders. They go into war zones, they set up hospitals, and all of the combatants know that you don't touch that facility. They give the GPS coordinates to both the Afghanistan military and to the U.S. military. But what happens is the problem with us being the air power for other countries, but we don't have ground troops. I'm not saying we should have them, okay? I'm just saying here's the problem. The Afghanistan generals on the ground knew that that was a hospital, and they still called in our air power to hit that building. That's why they're mad. When, when the statements came out from the U.S. Uh, Defense Secretary Ash Carter, I guess is his name, they said, oh, it was collateral damage, which would meant it was a mistake that other bombings close to it hit that building. And the other thing was maybe, the, maybe we got something wrong, the GPS coordinates were wrong. That's why the Doctors Without Borders is saying it's a war crime, because that's not true. The, uh, the Taliban were running. We're going back into Kanduz, which is a city in Afghanistan that just Taliban just took a week ago. And so now we're going to go back in and try and take that city, Kanduz. And as we're going in and bombing those Taliban from the air, the generals for the Afghanistan army are on the ground telling us where to hit. And some Taliban fighters ran into that hospital. And the Afghanistan generals on the ground said, hit that hospital. We did. Now, did we know it was a hospital? This is a big question. But we are allowing those Afghanistan generals to make the decision. And so Doctors Without Borders is calling it a war crime. They're saying the U.S., they're saying it is not. That's why they're mad. It was, it was a decision made on the ground in Afghanistan, and those Taliban fighters ran in for refuge, is what the doctors are saying, the Doctors Without Borders. And even if they did shoot from the hospital, you don't take out the whole hospital and kill both patients and doctors and all. So, Doctors Without Borders are very mad. They're saying it's not collateral damage, it's... You targeted us. You targeted us because the Taliban ran into our building. Now, that's a problem. But the, the media is trying to change the narrative right now on a few things. That's one. Uh, those are the few notes. We're going to talk about Acts 1. Yesterday, uh, when I was with Andy for the day, Andy likes spending the whole day with me. And you say, why? Does, doesn't he struggle with addiction and all still uses? yes. But when he's with me, he knows we're doing ministry. And he does want, he wants to get out of that cycle. Some of the other guys are in it and they don't really want to get out of the cycle. But Andy, he would have spent the whole day with me today because he knows I'm going to go see his brother. But I, I might see Pops after that. And so I said, no, today Andy, I'm going to be out of town or out of the bluff. So I wanted you, I wanted you to get the feel that everybody, but when we were coming back, I was with him all day yesterday. I was impatient with Andy two weeks ago. And because, uh, oh, I was helping him out, and then we had a, he wanted to move things, and I was very impatient with him. A couple of things I won't mention. So yesterday, I wanted to be patient. <laughs> so he had a lot of runs, like, can you step at the stripes? I want to fill this up. I want to eat. I get a couple tacos, John. I bought him a couple of little things, <laughs> which is okay. And then as it started getting late, he said, I'm sorry, I know I'm, you know, uh, taking your time, John. I said, no, it's okay, Andy. Don't, you don't have to rush. We'll do these things today. And uh, I wanted to be patient with him. <laughs> but we saw Lance because Andy had to stop and get his brother's bike that it was left at one of the stores, his bicycle. So we put it in the trunk, but I, I had to go across the street because he was going to meet me. I stopped in the middle of the road. He had to get the bike. I said, I'll meet you across the street. And I saw Lance. I've not seen Lance. Lance is one of the 
younger guys that is like, he was in my meetings, I baptized Lance. And one day I was walking up to Timmins. And Lance, he did this to Andy's brother when I was there one day. Lance came up to Huey one day at uh, Timmins. And he's been telling everybody he was going to get Huey and, you know. And Huey was there, had a drink in his hand, and Lance did like a drop kick. And Lance says he's an MMA fighter and he used to be a big MMA fighter. And, he, you know, he's pretty muscular, Lance. And so everybody thought maybe he is or maybe he is, I don't know. But so he drop kicked Huey and broke the cup in his hand. And Yui was very scared, okay? And his brother, who I saw Yui last night. And he tried to calm Lance down. And uh, so I knew that that's, he's got that little thing in his head. But one day I was just walking up to Timmins from the field, because I parked in H-E-B. And I saw, I didn't really see Lance coming. But he's coming across like a grass area. And he was going to do that to me. And right when he got close, I realized he was ready to, like, do that drop kick. And I had a coffee. And he went, as he went to do that, my coffee went hot coffee. It went all over him. I, I might have thrown it at that moment, but that's why. And But Lance saw that, then I kind of flipped out a little bit. I used the F word, I'm sure, multiple times. But I was ready, you know, I was like... He could see I was I was just getting if you if people get in fights with other people when it comes right down to the moment of where you begin hitting each other you could see if the other person is is ready to do it or not or they kind of chicken out at the last minute you could always tell when you're actually ready to go for it <coughs> so Lance saw I was just realized oh he's trying to jump me you know I realized that so I was just going to try and get one very good punch in. That's basically what you try to do. And I was right, like, looking for that right at that moment. I was like, mad, cursed, and then I was just going to try to get a really good punch. And then he saw that, and he stopped. And then, but I was still mad, and we walked up to Timmins, and I was cursing. I said, get the F in front of me, and keep walking, and and then he felt bad because some people saw that and he told some of the people at Timmins, oh, John flipped out again because they know sometimes I do. And But in this case, it wasn't me just doing that. He said, John, he threw his coffee on me and he was going <coughs> to... And I said, no. I told the other people, no. I said, he tried to drop kick me like he did to you. I said, I know. It wasn't me freaking out. So, and then... He admitted it almost because later he came out and, and uh, Tammy said, he asked you, please don't say nothing else about it. I said, that's all right. I said, but he's wrong. I said, he's making it sound like I tried to jump him and that's not true. So anyway, I still loved him. The next day I helped him. I went back up to the mission and I even helped him out. But I haven't seen him in a while. He was in jail. Lance is from Pennsylvania. So, yesterday when I was waiting for Andy, it, Lance was crossing the street and I parked across the street for Andy to get the bike. And I figured, oh, if he comes this way, I'll talk to him. So he saw me, I got out of the car, and he always looks a little like, you know, uh, is John going to be this way? And I never know if they're going to be like that. I can't tell either. But as he got closer, I said, hey, kid, come here. And everything's good. I'm we made up for that thing a long time ago. I told him, I'm getting ready to go north, New Jersey, New York. And Lance want, can I drive with you, John? And I would take him if I wanted to take people, because he wants to go back to Pennsylvania to visit family. I said, Lance, I'm a loner. I, when I'm in the car, Andy said the same thing. Maybe I'll go with you, John. If my The guys do want to make these trips that I make, but I would never, I would not be good with somebody else in the car. I drive straight. I don't eat till I stop at 10 or 11 on those trips. So all day I just drive, stop for gas, use the bathroom, get in, drive, stop for gas, use the bathroom. That's it. I don't do nothing else. <coughs> all right, a few little updates I gave you there. <coughs> I read Acts 1 and Numbers. I read something in Psalms. had some interesting experiences. I mean, I read Psalms 
Every morning I'll read a psalm, in the evening I'll read a few chapters and then a proverb. And I always mark where I stop. I'll go to the next one next time. But man, I read a psalm and I read through it and it was like brand new. Like, okay, I haven't read this recently. And then I realized I had just read it. And I saw everything different. It was very interesting. I could teach that. But I, I think I'll do the Acts thing right now. I had an interesting thing with Acts. Acts 1. I don't remember if I ever did a teaching on the book of Acts. I might have done a whole study on it. I, I don't remember. You could check on the website. It might be there. What we're going to see. In Acts chapter 1. Written by Luke. Who wrote Luke. Book, Gospel of Luke as well, we're beginning to see this is the account of Jesus commanded his disciples by the Holy Spirit, he taught them, and then he told them, wait in Jerusalem for the promise, which was the promise that the Holy Spirit was going to come, and those that study scripture understand that God sent the Holy Spirit, and it was in coordination with with the fulfillment of the Jewish feasts, the Jewish festivals, the Lord's feasts in the Old Testament given to the nation of Israel. And the one it coincides with is Pentecost, the day of Pentecost. And that's why in Acts chapter 2 the Holy Spirit does come, because it was a set time. Jesus himself and his death, burial and resurrection was fulfillment of the Passover feast which I've taught that before. So there's a connection with the feasts and the fulfillment of things. Recently, we had a lot. There was a preacher in New Jersey. I knew this preacher, not personally, but before he became famous. Uh, and I'm, I have not followed it well, but I think it's Jonathan Kahn's or Kahn. But the reason he recently, this year, wrote a book, he became famous, more famous these last few years, and he's a good man, uh, but he wrote a book on, tried to coincide the event that we had with these red moons, and how this year, the red moon, they call it the blood moon, but the scripture says when the moon turns into blood, or when you see a red moon, and when these things, events coincide with certain feasts, Jewish feasts, some saw that there would be a lot of significance and that feast and the, co and the coordination of the moon that just took place, I think Jonathan Collins, this preacher, I believe is from New Jersey, wrote a book about it. And they thought something real catastrophic was going to happen. It did not happen on the day that it was prophesied and the book was written. And now some of the charismatic websites and all are now posting teachings like, well, why didn't it happen? And this is a history of Christianity. Sometimes certain Christians, well-meaning ones, make prophecies based on things like that. This, I was uncomfortable, and I was very aware of those that were predicting the blood moon or the red moon, along with the certain feasts. And I, I understood it, but there's nothing in Scripture that says if feasts particularly coincide with the certain events in the blood moon or red moon. There's nothing that says that. So <laughs> I was hesitant. And those of you who know that I do believe that some events will be taking place geopolitically because you hear me talk, <coughs> I was very hesitant to say, and this blood moon along with the feast is going to have something to do with it. And as far as we know, it really didn't. But in Acts, we do read that Jesus had a specific time for the disciples to wait, and it did coincide with the Feast of Pentecost. And the Spirit would come. That was like a fulfillment of the Jewish Feast in a broader sense, which is going to mean something as we study Acts. Something that was interesting. Uh, in the book of Acts, in chapter 1, it, it's, it's leading up to the big chapter, chapter 2 and the fulfillment of the Holy Spirit, and the explosion that takes place as they go out and preach the gospel. But you kind of get the theme in Acts 1.8. Jesus said, I want you guys to go wait for the promise. 
And when the Spirit comes, you will receive power. After that, the Holy Spirit has come upon you, and you will be witnesses unto me in Judea, Jerusalem, unto the uttermost parts of the earth. So that's the theme. The Spirit's going to come, and then you're going to be witnesses. You followers, believers, you're going to witness, you're going to testify. Throughout Acts, we're going to begin seeing how Peter, the first 15 chapters or so, until you get the main character, then it becomes the Apostle Paul, the last part of the book of Acts. But you're going to begin seeing Peter. I taught this the other day when I was with Sweet Pea and uh, Pops at one of the meetings. Peter begins unfolding the prophecies in the book of Psalms and how they're all so significant and the things that King David spoke by the Holy Spirit and how they're all being fulfilled and, and the time is now. And, and what's significant, and some of you won't get this, some of these things on my, some of these videos, some people understand a lot of stuff from these videos. Like Christians can really say, you know, I'm getting some of these things. Others don't get everything. And I understand that. That's, that's the way it is as we grow as Christians. But, some of you will understand what I'm going to say right now. The first prophecy, I caught me a little by surprise, I'm familiar with it. The first one that Peter unfolds from King David in the book of Psalms, which becomes a theme as we go through. It's my cat trying to get in. The first one is what? Peter says, men and brethren, this scripture had to be fulfilled which the Holy Spirit spoke by the mouth of David concerning Judas. It's the first unfolding of what the Psalms were saying, that things that were going to happen. And he said the first one had to be what the Holy Spirit said about Judas, that let another take his office. It's Psalms 109. And those of you who follow my site, Psalms 109 was kind of significant this last year. And <clears throat> that's the first one he, Peter quotes. And he's going to quote many about Psalms and David. And, and let me read a few. Verse 18. Now this man purchased a field with the reward of iniquity falling headlong. Judas betrayed the Lord. <coughs> and the money that he used that later it bought a gravesite. He burst uh, and he died. He committed suicide. And all his bowels gushed out. And it was known unto all the dwellers at Jerusalem, insomuch that the field is called in its proper tongue the field of blood. For it is written in the book of Psalms. This is Psalms 109. First quote you get from Peter in this prophetic unveiling of the Psalms in the book of Acts. Let his habitation be desolate, and let no man dwell therein, and his office let another take. And then they make a decision which one, there are two candidates that are going to fulfill Judas's place. And I found that significant because it said that was a sign. That was a sign. God, even in his judgments, he leaves signs. He leaves markers so people will remember things. And I read number 17. And number 17... The other day I mentioned from the book of Numbers how some leaders in, in the nation of Israel in the Old Testament, how they rose up against Moses and Aaron. This is a story of Korah, Dathan, and Abiram, how the earth opened up and swallowed them. I talked about that the other day. <coughs> and God vindicated his leadership, Moses and Aaron, and he said, no, I did choose them. And it was my will that I would use them. And number 17 is a story where right after that happened, and God said, I want you to take one stick, one rod for each family. Here it's like a stick. And each stick, you're going to write the name of the tribe on the stick. And Aaron's name is written for Levi. God was doing a sign, put the sticks up before me, the tabernacle and the one that buds and blossoms, that's who I choose. 
and Aaron's rod budded, and God was saying, but that was a sign. It was a sign for the rebels. And the Lord said unto Moses, Bring Aaron's rod again before the testimony to be kept as a sign against the rebels, so, and take away their murmurings from me. And all the children of Israel saw it, and they understood. God, in both these cases, Acts 1, and then I jumped to Numbers the other day when I was reading, in both of them, God was saying, I also wanted the people to remember my just judgments. I wanted them to see that, no, God was doing certain things. And I found it very interesting that the one psalm, the first psalm that Peter quotes as God beginning to work is from Psalms 109, which was very significant this last year in ways that I spoke about. <coughs> Meaning... God's also going to do great things because these other chapters as we progress in the book of Acts, we're going to see great things. And I'll make one more note. It would be hard to do it all right now. But the disciples asked, Lord, in Acts 1, Lord, at this time will you restore the kingdom to Israel? And Jesus responds and says, It's not for you to know the times of the seasons, that the Father uh, has in his own power. It's not for you to know the times or the seasons. Let me, let me read that to you, if I can pull it up again. The reason that's significant, and it would be hard to do it all right now, but the response... Let's see. And when they asked of him, they asked him, saying, Lord, wilt thou at this time restore again the kingdom to Israel, or give back the kingdom to Israel? And he said unto them, It is not for you to know the times or seasons which the Father hath put in his own power, but you will receive power. <coughs> well, they, the question they had there, and then we're going to end, is all of Israel, the nation itself at the time of Jesus, they were looking for a Messiah, a deliverer, but they understood primarily that he would deliver them from the oppression of Rome, who was the oppressive ruling authority over them. That was their history, which I taught a lot this last year, the intertestamental period, <coughs> even Alexander the Great, Antiochus Epiphanes, uh, Judah Maccabee, the, uh, the war they had which Hanukkah is to celebrate, all of that history was the Jewish people looking, someday somebody's going to come and deliver us from this political oppression we're under. So that was a big understanding that they had. <clears throat> so they asked him, is now, Jesus, now after all this, your death, burial, resurrection, before he's ascended, this is what he's talking to them about. Because he ascends in chapter 1. He ascends up into heaven and there are two angels. But they wanted to know whether Jesus at this time would be a politically a political king and a political figure that would rule over them as an actual king right there. And as as a ruler in the actual nation of Israel. And when he says it's not for you know the times of the seasons, it also could be seen as the character of the way these things are going to be fulfilled. And this is a very long debate within Christianity. And there are many, many Christians who fight over the certain views of these things. I think what Jesus is saying, especially when you begin reading the rest of the New Testament, some say Jesus is still going to be the political king over the actual physical nation of Israel at the return of Jesus. I believe in the physical second coming. Some people do not. I do believe in the second coming. But then they see it in a way, this is a lot of end-time prophecy teaching, which I'm not in agreement with a lot of it. Those of you who have watched these videos know. And some think Jesus will come back, and if it was next week, that means Netanyahu, Bibi Netanyahu is now the leader of Israel, he'd be removed, and Jesus physically himself, there'll be a restoration of the temple, the 
So the adherents to this view would say he can't do it until that temple is restored. But they would say that the temple will be rebuilt physically in Israel. Jesus physically, there will be reinstitution of sacrifices and all these things, and I don't believe any of that is going to happen, or it's not ordained of God to happen, theologically, because the sacrificial system is done. But that Jesus is going to, there will be reinstitution of all of it, and then Jesus will actually lead a military campaign. And the things we read in Revelation about the enemies being wiped out, they're seeing Jesus as, you know, uh, there will be the power of God doing it, but all the Arabs and Muslims are all going to be decimated and all. Now that view, not only do I feel it's not in keeping with Scripture, but it could be, that could be such a radical view that, in our day and age, could be very harmful. And I don't hold to that view. But some hold to it because they say here, when the disciples said, are you at this time, 2,000 years ago, going to restore the kingdom to us? And he says, it's not for you to know the times or the character of the way it will take place. And the great unveiling of the New Testament is we are all now the Israel of God. Jew and Gentile. We are all now the people of God, and we are going to be the heirs of all nations because we are all the people of God that believe in Christ. So, we're going to begin seeing in the book of Acts that Peter, right in the next chapter, chapter 2, when we get to it, he says, the promise that God made that an heir of King David would someday sit upon the throne, Peter is not interpreting that as you're going to have a physical uh, rulership right out of the nation of Israel that will be the political rule. But Peter interprets it that when Jesus is raised, ascended, he's seated, and these promises are now fulfilled in the broader scope in the kingdom of God. So, in a nutshell, Jesus' response to them, I believe, is this. He says, you don't understand yet, disciples. You're going to. You're going to understand when Paul gets converted in Acts 9, and my spirit reveals through Paul many unfolding mysteries about the nature of, of the people of God, the Israel of God, as the New Covenant community. All these wonderful things you're going to learn from my spirit speaking through Paul primarily, but all of the other prophets and teachers. And it would be too much to answer that whole question right there, at that moment, to those disciples. So, Jesus told them one time, and I think the Gospel of John, I have many things to say unto you, but you just can't all bear them now. Or you can't get it all at once. And so, I really think that Jesus, when they asked him, are you going to restore the kingdom at this time? Are you going to be the king? We're going to fight Rome off, and we're going to reestablish a physical thing right here, the kingdom right here. And the verses where Jesus in the Gospel said, the kingdom of God cometh not with observation, for behold, the kingdom of God is within you. He was already laying the groundwork for them to understand that the kingdom of God and the rule of God would be this rule of God in the hearts of humanity who believe in him, and that it would be expressed in a much broader scope. And Jesus, his kingdom has not been postponed. A lot of people that hold to this dispensationalist view say the kingdom's been put off, we're in a church age. We are in a church age, but we're also in a kingdom age. It's going to find ultimate fulfillment at the return of Christ, but it's not been postponed. He is sitting at the right hand of the throne of God. And so the disciples had more of a limited view of him, Jesus, restoring the political rule of Israel at that time in a way that in his own prophecies, in the Gospels, when he said the, the temple would be destroyed, not once, that would violate his own prophetic words that Jesus himself gave, that the physical system of sacrifice, temple law, was all passing. But there's a new kingdom, and that was the message of the kingdom of God that Jesus was preaching. As a matter of fact, when we get to the last chapter of Acts, Paul is in a rented place in Rome speaking about the kingdom the broader scope of the kingdom of God, not a limited political view. Now, I threw a lot out in that last three minutes, but that's, that's laying the groundwork, okay? 
and it's about 35 minutes. Read Acts 1 and number 17. God, God did things even in the area of judgment. And the first psalm quoted as the unfolding of psalms is going to take place in the book of Acts is Psalms 109. Let another take his office. And that was God's dealing, and he wanted that to be a sign. So this would say, okay, let's pray. Father, I thank you for all of our friends and all of our people. <coughs> I pray you'd bless each one. <coughs> I pray today as I go out and interact with some of my friends that you'd work in all of us, work the kingdom of God, which I was talking about today. Let it be expressed through us. Let it be seen in us, not just knowledge or intellect, but the kingdom of God, the love of God, the things, the character of Jesus being manifest inside of us. The kingdom is within us. I bless all these people. The Lord bless thee and keep thee. The Lord make his face shine upon thee and be gracious unto thee. The Lord lift up his countenance upon thee and give thee peace. God bless you all.